who's coming to join us. Yeah, I can see participants. So that's always, a, that's always a good sign. Welcome everybody. Um, let's make sure you open the chat and please say, say hello to us and let us know who you are, where you work. Uh, a very important and a bit of a silly thing uh, that I'm going to ask you to do is to set the two fields at the bottom to all panelists and attendees. And if you know a heck of setting that to the default setting, uh, please drop me an email. But uh, because we haven't figured it out yet, uh, but please say please say hi in the chat. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be using the chat lots today uh, with lots of questions and comments, and um, we also allow for disagreements if they civilized. Mm. So please let us know um, if you can hear us. I'm going to um, put a slide on so you know you've come to the right thing. This is where we are. Um, lots of participants already uh, rushing in, so that's great to see. Um, come on, guys, I need you to chat so I know everyone can hear us. Ah, oh, there's the chat. So hello, jo Joanne. Good to, good to see you. A nice, nice long, nice long message from Georgina. Amanda can hear us. Great to, um, great to have you all in the session. This is really going to be uh, one of the better hours spent uh, this week. So um, I think I can congratulate you for for joining already. I think it's going to be an awesome session. Um, and I know this because I've spoken to all these three uh, lo lovely people on the on the panel. Um, so I've got some prior prior insights. So yeah, like uh, like Georgie, Georgina says in the in the chat. So please, 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 um, at the bottom, change your two fields to all panelists and attendees, so everyone can see who you are, what your brilliant questions are. Um, and I think this is a good time to start officially. As you can see, we've got four people here, and in for a treat. I think. Let me just go to the right. There's like an official beginning that I'm going to more or less read, but I have to be able to find it. Where's this thing? There. Okay, so the official beginning to this webinar goes like this. Some of the most important unsung heroes of the last 12 months are South Africa's small and medium-sized accounting practices. So today we'll be hearing stories from three absolute accounting superstars, um, and you've recognized hopefully some of them already. Uh, and it's a, it's a webinar made possible by ACCA. Um, so welcome again. Uh, my name is Joel, Joel Rurich, and I'm the Managing Director of CFO South Africa. Um, ACCA is such a firm supporter of the CFO community and the finance and our network. Uh, so when, when ACCA Director Pat Semenya and I was, were brainstorming about this particular webinar, she immediately sort of said, um, the unsung heroes of this pandemic don't work at big corporates or, or let alone in politics, but they are in the trenches at SMEs. So in particular, and that's what we're shining a light on today, is the small and medium-sized practices, the SMPs. So um, Pat also said that globally, SMPs really provided a safety net for thousands, probably 10,000s, 100,000s of businesses trying to rebuild and steer their way through the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's where the idea of this webinar came from. So it's really great to see so many people join, join the session, well over 100 already. So please say hi in the chat and, and let us know where you work. Make sure you select all attendees and panelists at the bottom because it's, not off, it's really not often that you can engage with, um, with accounting heroes like, uh, like today. We've got three of them. So let me introduce the panelists to you. We've got Putanang, Putanang Motilwa, uh, co-founder and director at PSTM Auditors, 100% uh, black, black female-owned financial services and advisory company, and she is based in Johannesburg. Then there's Johnny Eliades, founder of IE Chartered uh, Certified Accountants, and welcome to Free State, very fanatic ACCA supporter, um, he, and he, I think he even only employs ACCA people. And then we've got our friend Bashir Adams, um, CEO of uh, Nexia SABNT, and he is based, and he's only one of the, the four of us in the office. Um, he is based in his office in Centurion at the moment. So we're really grateful to have these um, three amazing leaders um, on, on the session tonight, today, and, and please don't be shy with your questions and comments uh, once again. Uh, we'll, we'll get to as many of them as possible. So 
Putin, before we zoom in on sort of your lessons and how you've been able to help SMEs, maybe you can talk us through the first few months into lockdown um, at your company and at, at PSTM. And since you're also responsible for HR, perhaps you can also explain a bit how you, how you managed to keep all the nervous accountants calm during those, uh, those crazy days of uh, lockdown. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks, Joel. I think if everybody just thinks back to that time of the early lockdown, there was so much uncertainty, you know, even when we were watching the president address us uh, on TV, you could see that uh, even he himself is worried because he doesn't really know what's going to happen tomorrow. I think the World Health Organization and our Department of Health, et cetera, had their great models, but we really didn't know what was going to happen. And um, so for us um, of key importance or from, from day one of when we were told to, that you know, we're, we're going to go into lockdown was to make sure that we stay engaged um, with all our stakeholders. So you know, we've got our suppliers, we've got our, um, our staff um, most importantly, and obviously there were also our clients um, and we had to get an understanding of how all of this really impacts uh, every single one of our, our stakeholders and how it's going to impact our operations as well and what our game plan was going to be. So um, it became important to make sure that our IT infrastructure can actually uh, support us being able to um, you know, listen to the instructions that we had received to say, you know, everybody needs to work from home unless you are essential services and you can then go to work if you are. So um, we spent um, a little bit of time just trying to sort that out. I, I think just before we went into lockdown, because there was a clear indication that we are going to go into lockdown, having looked at what was happening internationally. So luckily that we were able to, to, to get done um, before we went into lockdown and, and make sure that we've capacitated everyone to be able to, to sit at home and actually work. And then um, because of uh, clients, uh, you know, putting a pause on projects and some also having to stop working completely, uh, we then decided, you know, instead of having people sitting at home having no work, um, if, if there were delays or anything of that sort with, with clients is to then make sure that people are attending training. So we invested quite a bit in training in those early days, just so that we can um, make sure that people, uh, uh, you know, there's an investment and there's a return once we're able to get back to some sort of normality whenever that was going to be. Um, and then obviously the big thing that everybody had to do was to just pay careful attention to the cash flows and uh, forecast and see what does this look like? How many months do we have? Um, and what sort of communication do we need to send out to which level of stakeholder? What is it that who needs to know? Then I think in terms of um, what we had to do with our clients was also just to determine if they were operating and what level of operations they actually had going on during the hard lockdown. And we had to assist them with their own cash flow um, forecasting to see what the lockdown will mean from, from an accounting and cash flow perspective. What is it that they could sustain and for how long could they sustain it? Certainly in the SMME space, um, there really isn't much fat built into business models. And so that really became a very important exercise that we could do um, partnering up with our clients and, and trying to determine <clears throat> what the uncertainty meant for their business. Then there was also, um, because of reduced capacity, having a look at um, utilizing human resources differently. So if there is someone who, um, for example, I don't know, I can't think of an example, but if someone is now suddenly not working because of this lockdown, is there something that we can train them up on that they can do while we are still in lockdown? I think from the early days, the president requested that we should please try and preserve jobs. Um, and so, you know, we, we kept that in mind during every single thing that we were doing at the firm. 
And then um, there's also those other things that, you know, sit in the backseat when everything is so busy, assessment of your controls, looking at your business model and seeing if it is the right business model. So those are the sort of things that we had to engage our clients on in that time of, you know, what is going on while um, there was limited operations. Thanks, thanks, Putanang. And I see Michael is asking in the chat, is this, a, is this a COVID seminar? I think we'll be talking about COVID quite a bit, quite, quite a bit because I think the, the really the aim of this session is to shine a light on how SMPs uh, coped through the period of the pandemic, but also specifically what lessons we can derive from, from that, both in terms of accounting practices, but also just for SMEs. What sort of tips do they have? Because they're all SMEs um, in, the, in their own right. So, Johnny, uh, you told me you wanted to avoid retrenchment at all costs uh, last year, but you also, and that's a, that's a nice sort of positive um, approach to it, you also immediately started looking at new opportunities to sort of counterbalance what was going on. Um, what opportunities did you, did you spot and, and how did you sort of convince your staff that you hadn't lost your mind when, when, you, when you came in so positively? So, um, yeah, um, one of the things that we are proud of is that we focus we focus on the accounting and, and the accounting, the technical side of it, but also the mindset, the coaching, the mentoring and that. And um, because of I've been doing that for so many years that I immediately felt that this is going to be at the beginning stages, this is going to be more a psychological issue than really a practical issue, because there was so much concern in the marketplace. And the one thing I know, your biggest asset in your business is your people. So, and I found it, I was actually trying to calm people down and saying the first thing they want to do is start looking at retrenchments. And I felt that is ridiculous because um, in any economy, things are going to go down and things are going to go up. And where are your people going to go in a COVID um, a situation? So the first thing I said, um, I came in and... Um, and there's a thing of certainty. You've got to come in with certainty. You are the leader of your business. You've got to be certain. Although at times you've got to be honest that you might not have that solution right there, but you've got to go in with certainty. And so the certainty I went is, listen, guys, we are, we just, this is an announcement. This is where we are. Um, just, we are going to go through a situation, but just remember, let's put a bit of perspective in the situation. We are all in this boat, and most importantly, our clients are in this boat. Okay, so what is our objective? Our objective is to not sink. Okay, so our objective is to stay in business. Keep, you know, my my father was a supermarket owner, and um, he was he didn't have any education, he didn't finish school. But I remember in the supermarket, he said, "As long as the doors are open, you can find solutions." And I kept saying that all the time. As long as we keep our doors open, keep afloat, and everything is equal. So I said, first thing is, let's focus on our biggest asset, especially in the accounting profession. Um, it's your people. Now, just think, you have to go retrench people. One day, this is going to turn, and you are going to have to hire people, train people. Why would you want to go through that? So we were proud in, in communicating with our people, telling them. And um, I actually went on and said, listen, um, I'm going to not retrench anyone and I'm going to do what I can to keep your guys' salaries as, as it is. And if I can't, I will communicate that with you guys. But we are in this boat together and we are going to get out this thing together and we're not going to lose anybody. And, um, and, and some of the senior people came to me and said, you know, it's great you're saying that, but now let's get technical. How does that look like with cash flows? How does that look like? Okay. And then I went into, okay, so let's look at what is our profession. Our profession is we help businesses with their cash flow, with their business. There must be opportunities in a crisis. I always believe there's opportunities in a crisis. So where's the crisis? Well, number one is there are some great businesses, our clients, and who aren't our clients. Okay, so they are great. What can we offer to people? So if clients can't pay right now and their suppliers are going to be hard on them. Let's see what we can do to help those people. And we said, listen, we will help you. I mean, we've got, you've got to look at capacity. You've got the people, you've got free capacity. 
you might as well start providing a service. Now you're building up your brand reputation and that. So what we started doing is whoever needed our service to help them, we would go in and we would, there was no more, there was no more priceless. The priceless went out the window. It was like, okay, so let's negotiate. What is your situation? What problems are you on? Are you really in a cash flow? Because there were some great businesses that just needed cash for 12 months, 24 months to get through this. They weren't bad businesses. COVID started. And so what we now needed to, so we also spoke to investors and we said, listen, you were looking for investors. There were people with a lot of cash and now their returns were getting low. So we said, can we put these guys together? Maybe the guys want to sell some of their shares in their businesses. What can they do? And the other thing is we said, we looked at the banking system and we looked at the bailouts and a lot of the bailouts, you had to be compliant. And you won't believe how much work we started getting because now the guys wanted to apply for a bank loan, a COVID bailout. They wanted the investors, but the investors want to receive the financials. They want to receive their taxes up to date. They want to be compliant. And all of a sudden, we started getting more work than was, it was crazy the amount of work we were getting. And we actually believe that we were, we are going to have a better 2021 than we had in 2020 because we looked at the opportunities and we kept our people, without your people, you can't do the work. And we started finding opportunities. We took every one of our clients, we renegotiated the retainers, we renegotiated the price list. We said, what can you afford? Then we also went and we created a department of consultation, mediation between landlords and the tenant. And the tenant. So some of our clients were tenants, and therefore, we went and we got the guys around the table and said, listen, you're the landlord. What is your challenge? What is it? So listen, what can we do? How much do you guys need to get through this? You don't want to be looking for a new tenant when this thing gets through. So I, I did YouTube, I did videos. I started writing letters to the landlords, something that was out of our scope. But we thought that's how we're going to help our clients. We, we, we renegotiated SARS. We renegotiated deals with the landlords. We renegotiated loans with the banks, credit cards and all that. And um, we had actually had quite a lot of work. And what was our one objective? One, not to retrench any people. Two, keep our clients in business. Those were our two goals. Do whatever it takes to keep our clients in business and don't lose our assets, our staff. Uh, Adrian, I think uh, let's go to Bashir. We've heard a lot about uh, clients and a changing relationship with clients in a very fast time already, uh, Bashir. You also told me when we were prepping for the session uh, that part of your business was basically running like an NGO at some stage. How do you look back at those uh, those sort of lessons from, from last year? Um, you're on mute for now, uh, Bashir. Just le Joe, just listening to Johnny and, and, and Futanang, it's, it's, it's clear that all of us have been through more or less the same thing to different degrees and, and, and uh, different times. So I, I can tell you, and I remember quite fondly uh, in the kind of week running up to the, the, the announcement of the official lockdown, uh, I used to refer to myself as the epicenter of uh, COVID-19 in our office, because um, if, if, you, if you take our Centurion, our Gauteng office, um, it's, there's 200 people in that office. Around the country, there's 550 people in nine offices. Uh, so to manage all of that uh, was, was something. And all of a sudden, you had grown people who've been seasoned for the last 30 years in the profession. Let, let's be honest. None of us knew that in our lifetimes, we'll see lockdowns and restrictions on freedom of movement and all of those things. And, and I'd grown men in my office with tears in their eyes, not knowing if their jobs are going to be there. And I think we took a very similar view to, to Johnny on it. No one was going anywhere. It was that simple. We'd come out of it no matter what we did. And um, funny enough, our, our, our pre-COVID planning happened completely by default in 2019, where at one of the national partners meeting, I just hijacked the entire meeting. And I said, guys, if we don't look at digitization and automation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we're just going to get left behind. And, and I didn't know anything about COVID at the time, nothing at all. But when the lockdown came and when, when COVID came, et cetera, et cetera, <coughs> we, 
we were ready. We knew these things by default. We started the process in 2019. So, so, so getting 500 people working from home wasn't a big issue. Um, we we um, got most, we moved most of our training into that uh, first lockdown period, particularly with our new trainees that started with us in, in February. You can imagine in February, they really didn't do a hell of a lot of work from a training perspective to the time the lockdown came. So we moved all our training, our formal training for the year into the lockdown period. Uh, it, it got a few things done. It got your first years a little bit more empowered than what they were when they got in. It got uh, the, the training out of the way so that when lockdowns eventually started lifting, we were able to, to touch base with our clients and get out there and focus on them. Um, it gave people the opportunity to interact with each other. So, so, so the virtual rooms, the virtual training, et cetera, et cetera, allowed the senior people and the, new, and, and the newer people to get to know each other. But, but Joe, uh, the second part of that was clients. What happened with that? You, you know, clients you've been serving for 25 years, 27 years. I've had one that I've been looking after since the day we started the firm. That's 27 years ago. Um, and, and the guy phones you and he's literally got tears in his eyes and um, you hear it in his voice. And, you, you know, it's almost as if someone died and you don't know what to say to someone. And, and you actually, I found myself playing the role literally of a nonprofit organization. And, and I had some of my, my senior partners, et cetera, et cetera, playing that role where we were counseling our staff, keeping them on the right place, keeping their mindset, because I believe that's one of the biggest, biggest uh, impacts that COVID is having is psychologically on the mindset is how do we get past that? So, so, so we were doing a lot of that kind of counseling for our own people. And then the other thing was uh, helping clients. So, so it starts off with being able to counsel the guy, just, just lend him an ear and a shoulder in order for him to vent his frustration with the situation. Um, once you have that, then you take a step forward and you say, all right, so how do we help you? How, how can we actually help you make this better? And I mean, in, you know, that's where relationships between people uh, trump business and profitability. That's where it's about how do we help you? And, and you know what? After 27 years, I've made a profit on servicing you. Um, is it really gonna, gonna, gonna bankrupt us if we can actually give something back to maintain and preserve a 27 year relationship that probably because of our intervention um, can see another 27 years? You know, and, and that's the kind of calls that you're making at the. Are we making the investment today to save a client that's probably going to be around for 20 years in the future and more than likely will remain your client unless something goes horribly wrong? Um, and, and that was the view that, that, that we took on it. Um, funny enough, I stayed absolutely positive with it. And, and I mean, we, we're 12 months into it uh, and the proof of the pudding is in the eating. In 12 months, our headcount has grown from 520 people to 550 people. Um, we have not had to replenish anyone. We didn't have any cuts of any sort in, in things like salaries and remuneration. We increased our corporate social responsibility just because of uh, the impact uh, that COVID has had on poverty and, um, and food security in South Africa. Our people started realizing that and says, listen, what can we do about this? Can we get involved there? Can we get involved there? So, so, so we weren't too worried about our bottom line, but preserving uh, the, the social fabric of, of the communities in which we operated. And, and that made a very, very, very big difference in us going forward. So, so 12 months later, I think, um, like I said, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We've achieved all of that. We've, we've outstripped anything we've previously done in corporate social responsibility, but I can tell you, we put about 10 million bucks into co uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives last year. We haven't retrenched anybody. We've grown the headcount. Um, we haven't had to dip into people's remuneration, et cetera, et cetera. And we helped our clients. There, there's, I can tell you, we did 99% of all the TERS applications with UIF. We did for our clients for free. We said to them, that's it. We're doing it for free to see that you get through this. 
Um, we, we didn't charge anyone. And, and there's some clients that look at us today and say, we'd never have got through this thing if we didn't. I hope the, the one client that paid is not listening, but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it, it's very remarkable how, how similar your stories are. And I, I mean, in one, in the, when we send out the invite to this webinar, we said it's actually time for a bit of a, to hear some, to have a bit of a good news story every now and then as well. And there are some, some amazing things that have, have come out, come out of this in terms of the power of, uh, of leaders in SMEs in particular. Um, maybe before I move on and, and, and move to the lessons and maybe how does remote, uh, remote working work for, for smaller businesses, etc. Maybe if, if you guys are all honest, a very quick answer. If you had, if you um, could one could do one thing again that you did last year that you're actually not so proud of or that, that, you, that you thought you should have done better. Could you just pick, a, pick out one thing quickly, uh, Johnny? One thing that you say we could have done better. Yeah. Well, I think I think what we could have done better is, uh, I would say, a bit more of what we did. Uh, um, we did have some situations with. I think my biggest thing that we didn't, we could have done better, is between landlords and um, and tenants. Uh, we weren't very successful on all cases, and it was it was quite hard for those clients of ours that the landlords wouldn't budge. And um, I would have re-looked at the strategy. I would have re-looked at we think of everything. And uh, that was something I wasn't, I wouldn't say it's the best stories. We did very well, but I think we could have done uh, better because I mean, your two things are your employees and your rent. And if your landlord's against you, and respect to the landlord, because he's got a bond to pay. But um, I think we're uh, catching me just off guard there quickly on that question. I think that's what comes to, that what comes to mind. Um, yeah. You get bonus point because I asked you first and put in an yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Put an anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I think um, the, the one thing that comes to mind for me, um, I share the sentiments of everybody that, you know, your staff is very, very important. And um, for me, we, we really engaged with the staff. But I think as time went on, we got the sense that they wanted more regular engagement and probably a little bit more detail. I think, you know, when, when you're sitting in an, an uncertain position, you look to someone for reassurance. And, you know, if, 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 if you're not hearing it from that someone, you, you start feeling a little bit, you know, um, unstable. So I think for me, it, it, it was in the regular communication. We probably communicated everything we wanted to communicate, but, you know, here and there. Um, and I think what we, what we probably needed to do was to schedule actually more regular engagement with staff and also just to hear, you know, the headspace, where is everyone? Um, because some things you hear from speaking to someone else and you pick it up and only then you address it, but you're actually responding versus being proactive about it. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one as well, Bashir. Well, this may, may sound absolutely weird and, and I'm not for one second saying that, um, that we were perfect in what we did, uh, but I think given the uncertainty and, and the re reality of what hit us at the time, I actually don't think we could have done anything any better. I think we did everything that was possible that we could have done in the circumstances uh, to, to get through it. Now, now, going back, the reality is we can say we should have done everything a little bit better. We should have planned it a little bit better. We should have interacted a little bit better. We should have communicated a little bit better. We could have done all of it. But who knew what COVID-19 was about? Who knew uh, that the lockdown, who knew that we'd have the strictest lockdown in the world? Um, who knew that we'd have staff uh, who were buying cigarettes on, 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 from, from backdoor vendors, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to keep things going? And, and I'm saying there was, there was so much uncertainty that I think with hindsight, you can say we'd, we'd, we'd do a lot of, of, of things. But I think we'd have pretty much gone down the same path and probably trying to improve everything of what we did and stepping that up a level. Um, but, but there wouldn't be anything specifically that I'd change in the, in the approach that we've taken. 
That speaks to the lessons that we've all learned over the last sort of 12, 13 months, I think, uh, that we figured things out with a, with a positive mindset. And especially you, you, the three of you seems to be in that category, which is fantastic to hear. Um, so staying with you, um, uh, you told us just before the session, you're actually quite happy to be back in your office. Um, do, do you think accountants can work remotely forever or is that just not something that works for, uh, for, for companies like yours? Well, I think there's a, there's a balance. Um, is there a place, for, a, a place for, for remote working? Absolutely. If someone asked me 18 months ago, two years ago, can you do a, a full audit on, uh, from a remote perspective, my, I'd probably have laughed in their faces and said, you've got to be kidding. Uh, ask me the same question now. I tell you what, we can do 95% of an audit remotely um, and, and, and close that out. So, so absolutely, there's a place for, for, for remote working. And I think a large chunk of it will be with us forever. We'd never go back to, to where we were. Um, I do our everything in the, specifically in the accounting profession where much of the profession is one of training and learning and coaching future generations. Those things uh, we find are a lot more effective um, in, in a physical uh, manner as opposed to doing it virtually. So, so things like on-the-job training, things like interaction between a manager and their trainees, things like interaction between a trainee um, and their, their audit partners and stuff like that. I, I, the preference would be that those things happen physically. So I think uh, the future is going to be the medium and the balance that we find between complete remote working and the stuff that, that do require physical presence, physical interaction, and, and, and uh, contributes to social well-being of, of your, your teams and your, your, your staff, et cetera. Uh, Putinang, we had a chat about, about this as well, remote working. You said it actually requires quite a different management style and, and maybe not something that your, your managers uh, are traditionally used to, uh, to, to manage accounts in such a way. How, have you guys resolved how you're going to go forward? Yeah, um, I think, you know, if I'm honest about it, I, I was raised as in, you know, when I did my articles, I was raised in an environment where if you're not here, you're probably not working, you know, and, and you, you know, you almost had to make sure that your manager or your partner, someone must see you um, so that they can also just, you know, rest a bit that, okay, well, this Pitanak, she is working, I saw her. But um, that is obviously not going to work in this type of an environment. Um, and I think so. In terms of our firm, the, the, we've, we've employed various strategies um, in order to make sure that, you know, we, we're not compromising on the quality and the service um, to our clients, but also you don't want your people to be micromanaging your staff. You know, you don't want the management to micromanage the staff because that also has other implications. Um, but, you know, what we've done is we have structured um, check-ins. I think it's important to make sure that we agree when are we gonna when are we gonna have a discussion. Is it going to be on a daily basis? Is it going to be every second day, um, etc. So there has to be some sort of an agreement between uh, the people involved on how often are we going to engage each other. And then there there really is that. Um, extra effort that, that needs to be involved in remaining collaborative. I think, you know, as Bashir said, when you're doing on the job training, it's, it's quite easy because the person is right here next to you. You can read their body language. You can read their facial expression. You really can, under, you get it immediately when the person doesn't understand. But when we are on Teams or we're in Zoom or any one of these um, online meeting platforms, it's very difficult to, to gauge whether the person understands or not. And, and it takes that extra effort and, and, and developing that sense because obviously it impacts on your deliverables if people don't understand and there's delays, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, there has to be clear rules of engagement. You know, I think in the early days, because of, of what was going on, you know, you would get a phone call from a client at nine o'clock because they're just figuring, well, everybody's working from home. And I think to be honest, there were quite a few of us who actually blurred the lines between office and home. You, you would come to work, you'd be at your desk by seven o'clock 
and you would leave your desk by seven o'clock again and and you know at some point it, it it gets exhausting and and you have to define okay well you know I'm still working and these are still my working hours and so you know whether it's myself calling someone or a client calling me I think there has to be those clear rules to say um, can I call you after hours because I think people did get to a point where it was just you know I'm exhausted I'm I'm teamsed out and I'm I'm zoomed out, you know, those are the phrases that we would say to each other. And then I think there's, there's also making sure that we allow for check-in time. So I think, you know, when, when you see people at the office, at the client, it's quite easy to have a discussion that is around not work. So, you know, how did something go last night or, you know, something to that effect. So I think it, it, it then became important for us to set aside time, whether at the beginning of a meeting or at the end of a meeting, to say, guys, how, how are you doing? You know, how's your mother? Your father contracted um, COVID. Is he out of the hospital now? You know, other, otherwise, it, it's so easy in, in these platforms to just jump straight into business and, uh, and move on to the next meeting. I think we were saying earlier, you've got a meeting two to three, then three o'clock, there's another one. And, and you know, they, they're just, they're lagging. Um, you're lagging between meetings and there's also just offering an ear to people you know um, and, and, and allowing people to say to you whatever is on their minds uh, there was quite a lot on people's minds so to just make it clear that I am listening I am hearing what you're saying even if I may not have a solution but I can actually listen to what you're saying um, and then also just to be understanding, you know, I think, I don't know how many Teams calls I've been on when you can hear a child crying in the background and you've just got to be, you know, um, be a little bit compassionate and understand that, you know, maybe this person has to go and attend to this child or whatever it is that they have to do, um, which ordinarily we don't have those sort of disturbances when we're sitting in the office. And then um, also, I think, because of the nature of Teams <clears throat> and, and all these online platforms, like I said, it's easy to just jump straight into business, but it's important to just remember that the staff is at work because they're trying to build their careers. So it was very important for us to just always come back to that and say, people are on a career path. What we are doing with them today, is it actually enabling them to be you know, great chartered accountants in the future? Is there anything that we need to amend in order to make sure that we actually offer exactly that to them? And, um, and yeah, I think, I mean, we, we, we're used to it. And I do think that in future, it'll probably be a hybrid model. Um, you know, I think about my, my intake from last year, my intake from this year. And uh, for these groups, this is actually quite normal for them. For us, um, the people who worked before, um, it, it, there is still some element of it being strange. You know, when you go to the office and it's, it's a little bit on the empty side, it feels, it feels strange, but yeah, it is, I suppose this is here to stay probably. The BC and the AC generations uh, pitted against each other in a, in a sense. Um, it's very interesting. It was great to be on a, on a webinar with three uh, top accountants uh, who have, uh, who can talk about soft skills and all the leadership uh, traits uh, uh, that are necessary in terms of times of crisis uh, so much as you three. So that's, uh, th thank you for that. Uh, Johnny, just, just moving to you and, and maybe zooming in on, on some of the lessons that you, um, that you have picked up for, for yourself, but also for your clients, SM, SMEs in, in South Africa, things that, that we, um, through the misery, basically have, uh, have, have learned. Um, what, what sort of, what, what could you name? Well, uh, are you saying what did we learn and, and our clients have learned? I, I think I think the biggest lesson that clients um, learned was that it's it's not over. It's it's they they sometimes write themselves off and they don't put their numbers into perspective. So sometimes, so I'll give you an example. I had a client that was, uh, he owns a restaurant and um, he was very, very negative. And um, uh, uh, so that um, one day he was speaking about his gun and it was getting scary and um, he doesn't know how he's gonna get out of this. And um, it was just, it was just ridiculous. And, and as, an account you feel a bit uncomfortable in that conversation you know and um 
And then I looked at his financials and I said, I, I don't understand where's the concern here. Well, let's put your life, let's put your business in perspective. And this specific client, he was lucky. His restaurant was paid off. He's, um, he, he didn't have any debt. Um, and he was going like berserk on how will he make it. And I just asked him a question. I said, listen, what happens if you do have a loan of 500,000 rand? And I worked it out. Let's take a 500,000 rand loan over five years. And let's say this loan comes into effect and you only owed 500,000 rand. Um, what, how would that look like? I mean, would your business in one year's time be able to pay that bond? Yeah, of course, easy, Johnny. I mean, we do so. Okay, so great. So you don't have debt. Let's just put your business into perspective. Let's put your life into perspective. And I think clients um, needed that from us, from accountants. They, there's, there's, a, there's this thing in when you coach someone, if they see a problem, they will, they will say the problem over and over in their mind in a different scenario so in the sense that you know what i built this restaurant for 20 years it belonged to my dad and now i'm going to lose it or now the bank's going to take away my restaurant how will i look after my family that i'm going to lose my house i'm going to so you say the same story in a different manner but the mind listens to a different story so you start making it worse than it is and if you actually have to write down what is the problem you have how can they take your restaurant? How can you lose your restaurant? Well, the landlord could go, okay, so let's go to the landlord and speak to him. Oh, and this specific client, the landlord agreed to 50% discount on the rent, three months, no rent. So I said, so you, although you don't have debt, you don't have rent now to pay. Let's speak about your salaries. Well, the COVID buy, bailout, okay, so you don't have salaries. So now what, what's the problem now? So what happened was, um, we needed to put clients in perspective based on their numbers, based on their financial position. Now, there is the other side of things. There is the other side of things where clients were in trouble going into COVID, okay? And those were the worst clients to, to look at. And the problem I have there is they blamed COVID for the situation and they were not in the reality that COVID did not get you to this position. You were in this position already and you most probably would have been out of business. So we had to then mentor and coach people on that. But I think the biggest lesson is, and I must say one more thing, <laughs> there were happy clients saying, you know what, I didn't know what to tell people how I was gonna close my business. But now it's not really my fault, but he was already in trouble going into this thing. Now he's going, you know what? This was a COVID problem. It's got nothing to do with my business or what I borrowed money or I was overexposed or I didn't know what I was doing. Now he's like on top of the world and said, listen, I had to close my business because this was COVID. I mean, who are you fooling? You were going to close. You just got a bailout now as a excuse because of because of COVID. So there was all these things. And that's why I love being an accountant and a coach at the same time, because you can you can put people in perspective, but the numbers tell a story. And if you understand, I mean, accounting is the language of business. And if you are in a business and you have a challenge, the first thing is, do you, can you speak the language of business? And that is accounting. And if I can get you to understand that and put it in perspective with three different type of issues, did you come into it? Did you come into COVID with a problem? Can you get out of it? And maybe you're not in problems, but you've made it worse than it is. So I think perspective to me was the number one reason. And number two, people didn't know their numbers. It felt like people have these accountants and for once in their life, the numbers were so important on how they were going to get out. It's like, do my numbers, do my taxes and that. But have you ever sat there and know your numbers? Because now your numbers matter if you will make it next month. So that was my view on, on the issues that I felt I got out of that. Thanks. I'm sure um, the, the sponsor of this uh, session, ACCA, likes the, 
um, accounting as the language of um, of business, uh, Johnny. So well, well done. Um, and um, I've got a question from Kate. So maybe Bashir, you want to take it? She says, "How are you assessing business continuity now, uh, and does it diff uh, uh, differ materially from sort of the, the the phase that we went through? I guess in the last twelve months." Um, so, so I think it's, a, it's it's a very good question, but but I I, th I think we're not we're not out of it yet, and a number of, of businesses um, are still in it. Um, so from a business assessment and con continuity perspective, um, I, I think there's there's light at the end of the tunnel, but certainly um, we, we we'd be naive to say that that we're out of it. Now, does it differ from what we were looking at a year a year ago? Absolutely. Um, a year ago, we were um, at a point where some businesses just didn't see anything. And, and, and Joel, I'm going to link this to specifically some of the lessons that was, was learned in it. Um, and, and one of the first ones that comes out of it is, is actually have a plan, right? So, so for all specifically SMMEs, one, the lesson is don't take things for granted, right? So what happens if, if, if things don't turn out the way you, you plan for it to turn out? Where's... Where's, is there a buffer? Is there a reserve somewhere? It's very difficult for SMMEs to do it, but we've learned the hard way that we need to do it. Lesson number two, cash is king. Right? If you get cash, if you've got cash, if you can preserve cash, if you don't spend everything that you make on an ongoing basis, you can more than likely ride out most storms. Right? Because no matter how long a storm lasts, the cash will carry you through the first part of the storm and maybe put you in a position so that you can negotiate um, with your suppliers, creditors, and or investors uh, and other stakeholders going forward uh, on the second one. The third one was, uh, and, and this was more personal lesson than, than anything else, is the need and the importance of, of empathy and sympathy and being able to understand the individual plights of different parts of the ecosystem. So there's your staff, there's your clients, there's your suppliers, there's the communities in which you operate, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so having the empathy, empathy and understanding of the different people in, the, in those ecosystems. Um, and I think those are the kind of lessons that we need to take out. Those are the lessons and things that we need to understand when we assess things like business continuity. Um, and, and who knows? I mean, there was a tweet yesterday from one Dr. Taban from the midstream cleaning that, that says he's not absolutely sure whether he can trust government's numbers. He's beginning to see the signs of the third wave uh, hitting us already. Now, you look at that and you say, but if a doctor as well as, uh, or as renowned and as famed as Dr. Taban is questioning or, or, or creating doubt over the credibility of government's numbers, isn't that something we also need to sit down and think about? And, and, and how does that work? And how do we get to this point? How do we get to this point? Um, so I think that was the other thing that we've learned. And I think the last but not least, we, we, we learned that uh, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca isn't, no, isn't necessarily the answer to everything, is it? <laughs> yeah, let's see how that one uh, pans out. I, I don't think the four of us have anything clever to say about uh, vaccine development. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not me. Um, Futenang, your, your, your personal lessons of 2020? Yeah, um, I think for me, the, the biggest lesson I learned is that we are people first, you know. The humanity that we, we had to demonstrate to each other through the pandemic you know, is, is a good reminder that uh, before I'm an accountant, before I'm a business owner, et cetera, et cetera, I'm actually a human being, you know, and the compassion, the empathy, you know, all the stuff that we've been talking about is actually quite important because uh, with, without it, um, you are dealing with people in a very unproductive state of mind and so you you just you're not going to get anything done you know and um secondly i think it was very clear to me that stress testing your business model is very important obviously this goes for us as a firm but also for the clients that we service 
the business model that you have, is it going to carry you through whatever is going to, to come up? Can we actually do that stress test to see? And um, I think also was just to make sure that we are focusing on the outcomes versus activity. You know, I think we, we spoke at length about how, you know, it, it was very important to preserve businesses, to preserve jobs, and you need to always keep that end in mind in, in everything. Well, we had to keep that end in mind in everything that we were trying to do and always just come back to ask ourselves, is this going to get us to where we are trying to get to? And then also, I think lastly is on the communication is that, you know, when you do occupy a leadership role, whether you know, you, it is very important that, you know, that messaging comes through that positivity uh, because people actually draw strength from seeing you being positive. They may, you know, leave whatever meeting and say, I think she's gone crazy, but, you know, the absence of actually talking to them and, and, and reassuring them actually causes more problems than, than going to them and, and remaining positive. Thank you so much for that, Kutinang. And uh, yeah, just to the audience, we've got a couple minutes left. So um, if you have any questions about um, about um, accounting and auditing in the in the SME space, uh, let's uh, le let's hear it. Um, I always always have questions. I, I'm just sort of wondering um, uh, when you look at the massive companies, massive JSC listed companies, and the Sort of the, the the big the big auditors and, and accountants that service them. You hear a lot about um, uh, remote audits where you don't have to go into the office ever anymore. You don't have to see your client anymore. It's all automated. And, and Bashir was was uh, was mentioning technology um, as one of the differentiating factors already. Um, uh, Johnny, I don't know what what's your view on the the role of technology in the um, in the SME space uh, where you are. How do you see that develop? So I might have a bit of a view that is not aligned to everyone else, maybe because, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of training and uh, lecturing and bits and we said, I, I've done a few courses now online and um, this whole thing about my staff, I don't know, I, it's a bit lonely with no staff at the office, man. It's just, um, so... I understand when you guys say you zoomed out teams, uh, teams out and all that. And so my view is that um, I think you can cope and I think you can do work. You can do audits. I think, I mean, we've proven it. Um, but there's going to there's gonna be both. I, I like the hybrid comment that um, was said. Um, but I think eventually, if you want to beat your competition, you're going to get back to the office. I don't believe if you're competing against um, two, two companies competing and you don't have proximity. Proximity is power. There's more learning that's going on when you're around your team, when you can coach them, when you can mentor them, when you can speak to them, when people can share ideas. There's something to that. Okay, so if you are going to just go online and i think it is possible i think it's been proven i think there's going to be more technology uh, i think you can do audits you can do work um yesterday i had to travel seven hours which i would usually do every month to go see a client he would pay for it okay and um but i did a zoom call and i loved it i mean i did a zoom call it saved me we were two hours on the zoom i didn't have to drive seven hours Great, so that worked. But if I do that, and then I had another client that did Zoom calls, and then every three months we've been trying to fly down to Cape Town, there was another client, and they said, Johnny, we got much more out of this meeting, and I could upsell, I did other products and that, because you were in the boardroom, yeah, with us, speaking to us, you could have the body language. But my, my, my problem with this um, working from home I think it's good. I think it works, but I don't think it, it's. I think you're going to lose your competitive advantage, and I think you're going to you're going to lose that connection with your people and train them to it, 
to compete with another company that is just doing online. So I just have that challenge. I'm not saying it, I don't think it will ever go away. I don't think we'll ever go back to where we were. I think online and all that's gonna be a way of life. But um, I'm not a firm believer that offices are gonna go away and you must keep your staff at, at home. I think the more you can get your staff at work and connecting and in an environment together, the better your advantage will be to compete in the marketplace because your staff are your biggest asset. And if you can, if you can work with the staff and um, empower them, and you can empower your staff much more if you can sit around a table with them and just discuss it than I can do on this team's uh, meeting. That's my view. I know I've been getting a lot of slack on that view. Um, uh, we had an argument the other day with my clients. They think office blocks are going away. Sell all your office blocks. No one's ever going back to the office. It's the end of the world. Um, so uh, I don't have that view. And uh, I think um, in time, what's going to get people back to the office is the effectiveness and the productivity of their people will not be the same and people will bring people back to the office to be more productive, more effective than your opposition. That's my view on that. Yeah, that maybe bringing your own people back to the office can also be something different uh, from are you going to service your clients um, remotely um, uh, or more remotely and not. But she, I don't know, you brought up technology earlier. Do you, you want to sort of as, uh, elaborate a bit on the competitive advantage you see, so specifically in that sort of SME space? Um, Joel, so, so I, I agree with Johnny. There's always going to be more value than with someone in the boardroom and, and, and someone who you can physically touch, feel, and hug and, and, and just give you a sense of security uh, as opposed to sitting on the other side. Specifically, as far as SMME goes, uh, SMMEs go, I think me, history dictates to us that SMMEs by and large as a result of being the biggest employer, et cetera, et cetera. They're not first to market with things like automation and digitization and all of these things. They normally follow the big ones. But I think um, certain things to think about for now is that th the cost of technology is getting less and less with the, the, the amount of products that's, that's out there at the moment. So it's no longer that SMMEs need to make huge investments uh, in, 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 um, in technology when there's, uh, alternatives available for them. For example, uh, an SMME doesn't anymore have to go and in, invest in, in a huge suite of software when somebody can host that software in the cloud for them and they just pay the rental of the software on a monthly basis as opposed to actually owning, owning the software. So I think that's, that's the part that um, all SMMEs will be a miss uh, of, of not acknowledging that from an efficiency effectiveness perspective, Technology will, is what should be driving the business model going forward. So I think that's the first thing. Then, um, Joel, I see we've got a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to go into there. Let's touch on them quickly. We've got we've got a uh, two three. Let's let's give uh, two more extra minutes. So we've got four minutes left. Uh, maybe quickly on um, on Joanne's question, your uh, maybe just a quick tip from 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 Bashir, you, and then maybe Putanang on dealing with SARS and the Department of Labor because uh, we know there's been a lot of frustrations around that. Do you have you do you have a nuggets for us? Well, I, I don't I don't think there's a tip I can give you. In fact, I can I can invite the audience if if there's any of you that have a tip, please uh, share it with us because <laughs> I just think, uh, like, like I said in, in in our offline discussion, uh, I just think the public sector. Um, they've, they've come out the, the softest with it because they were all paid throughout the pandemic, their full salaries. Nobody was docked, nobody was retrenched, et cetera, et cetera. And I just think they found out uh, when you get paid and you stay at home, why the hell should we go back to work? And, and, and I really, really think more than it being counterproductive for us, I think the, the impact and the counterproductivity of that on the economy and on the country is 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 huge it's massive 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 you know without any, any suggestions uh yeah i think you know honestly not much more than that i think it's just important to to maintain the engagement with um any of the entities that you need to engage with i do understand it can be very frustrating trust me 
I think some of my staff um, does get very frustrated, you know, the accountants that have to deal with SARS, et cetera. Um, the only thing I can do is just buy them chocolate to say, I'm so sorry, but there really is not much <laughs> that I can do to make SARS more efficient. So I think we're all complaining about it. I think, I think that's where we should leave it. It's such a nice conclusion that if you really can't figure it out any more, then, uh, then you just buy, uh, buy a bit of chocolate. Um, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Johnny uh, Putinang and Bashir for, for, for the time you've made available to, to share your experience with us and your, your tips and your lessons. I'm uh, just quickly putting up the slide again. And thank you, obviously, uh, very much to, to ACSGA for making a session like this possible. I know they're really passionate about, um, um, about accounting, about diversity in accounting, about not only looking at the big ones, but also at the small ones. So I really appreciate the support of uh, ACCA for this uh, session. Uh, we'll, have a, we'll have much more, many more um, webinars in the next few um, weeks, uh, pretty much one a week as far as I'm concerned. So I think there's, um, uh, the next one is this one, Case Study Data Analytics at Anglo. Um, pretty cool next week, I think. Yeah, 22nd of April. So watch that space, join that crew. And then the next one is um, unlock treasury-led finance transformation. So those are two upcoming webinars. If you want to sign up for them, go to cfo.co.ca slash events uh, and click the buttons that are the correct ones for those particular sessions and sign up. Uh, we'd love to see you there again. For now, thanks everyone for joining. It was great uh, having you all and thanks for engaging in the chat. A last thanks to ACCA, Johnny, Bashir, and Putanang for, for your time and for your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yes, bye. thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.